Hey everybody, welcome back to Juice's Arthropods. My name is, as always, Juice, and today I'm very excited to talk about the long-awaited care guide for the Archisporeptus... <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to Juice's Arthropods. My name, as always, is Juice, and I am super excited to discuss the long-awaited, 11 months in fact, uh, Archospira streptis gigas, or the giant African millipede, cons, pros, and care guide. Before we go into the actual care, there's something that needs to be addressed here. Google giant African millipede range. It's where they live you're probably pulling up their Wikipedia page, and they're going to say that they live in the southern or southeastern parts of Africa. I, I, you'll also see <laughs> they're found along the western parts of Africa. Now, the reason I want to bring this up is everything that I'm going to talk about today is going to be ignoring what their natural habitat is like while taking a little bit of both practices from both regions that I've identified that have helped me not only care for these creatures, but breed these creatures. Now, the reason I'm mentioning all of this is because isn't it a little bit weird that no one can really agree upon what their range is for a 13 and a half inch gigantic millipede? And Africa, mind you, is not a country. It is a continent. That would be like if someone came to you and said, hey, where is this jumping spider from? And you said, oh, its natural habitat is from Virginia all the way down to Florida and then all the way to California and northwest of Washington. And you would say, that's the entire goddamn country. So what are you talking about, crazy? So that's what we're working with. Not a lot of information, and there's reasons behind some of that. And so we're going to just sit down for the next couple minutes, which will probably be too long, and just talk about how you got this incredibly expensive millipede. How do I keep it alive? So for these guys, let's first talk about diet. Diet is very important. As detritivores, it means they can eat everything from loose leaf litter to the actual uh, substrate that they're physically located in to whatever rotting fruit and vegetables they find along the way. Now, the substrate with all millipedes is obviously the large portion of what they're going to be eating, but I have found that utilizing a really good substrate uh, consistently putting fr uh, vegetables in there for it to rot, which will add more minerals into the soil, and then throwing pretty much anything that you would feed a tortoise, and if you don't know what you feed a tortoise, just Google foods you can feed your tortoise. Any of those foods, you can feed to these millipedes. Now, I would avoid things like corn that's just basically useless to them and can have some stomach issues, but don't get into all of that. Ultimately, Feed them greeny, leafy vegetables as long as they're not spinach directly because there's too many oxalates. Feed them some butternut squash. They love squash. They love cucumbers. And then make sure that they have a really good mineral-rich substrate, which you can actually find Juices Pay Dirt on my website right now, which is designed for these guys. And that way, you'll have something that will ultimately help them along. But here's the problem. You're going to need a lot of substrate, which we'll get into next. Now, ultimately, the biggest problem with the giant African millipede species in general is just the sheer size of the tank you have to have them in. This is a 13.2 to 13.6 inch millipede. Um, for my friends in Europe, convert that to centimeters. I'm, I'm sorry. I can't, I, got, I can't do everything for you. You know, you guys got this. Anyways, you need on average, when these things are growing up, you need to have a tank that is three times by three times by three times their actual length. So that means, in case you were curious, you need at minimum, we're talking a 37 by 37 by 37 inch container. So that's a very, very large container. Now, yes, you can get by having, say, a 25 gallon tank or a 50 gallon tank or a 100 gallon tank. I don't know aquatic tank sizes, guys. I just use giant bins because these are bugs, not freaking fish. So at the end of the day, you just want to make sure that you have something that's going to hold enough of that. You need the substrate to be deep, though. So you're talking 36 inches minimum or 38 inches minimum of substrate. So now equate that to 
What is three feet across by three feet across times three feet down? You're talking about some serious money if you're going to be buying some invertebrate soil. So my recommendation, if you don't buy it from me, where I mine costs about $15 for four pounds of it, I would go real cheap and then I would add my own stuff into it. And you can actually look at how to make my pay dirt online as well. Um, but I would do something like that because you're going to need a lot of soil, which is going to be very costly. Disclaimer, if everything you just heard me say about substrate in your brain went, cool, I'll get cocoa fiber or reptosoil, don't do that. You will kill your giant millipede. And these are not cheap. We're talking a 200, anywhere between 180 to $200 these, th these things are. So if you cheap out on your substrate, you will kill this creature. I li Listen to what I just said. If you put it on cocoa fiber, it's going to to die. Understand? Perfect. Now let's talk about humidity. In the beginning of this episode, you may have heard me talk about how there's a lot of different range when it comes to where these things are located. And the why that facet is important is because of my next bullet point, which is humidity. So if you have a wild range that nobody can seem to agree upon what its natural locale is, how do you keep the humidity just right? Well, you're in luck because I am in Northern California with a 50% humidity at all times, which means unless you live in an actual desert, it gets about as perfect as it can possibly be here for humidity, which is baseline even, baby. So what I do is in my enormous 37 gallon tub that I have, if not bigger than that, I have one side that I keep bone dry. I mean, literally desert dry. And I put the cork bark on that side. You need to give these guys a cork bark hide. They will always hide underneath it. They're not a big fan of the sunlight or light or anything like that. So they'll just pretty much chill under cork bark. They are still millipedes after all. The other side, I have damp. Now, when I just said damp, if you heard wet, you once again kill these guys. They are very, very, very particular about how you keep them. They need to be warm because they're from the continent of Africa. It's a very warm place there in every location imaginable. So you need to make sure that it's going to be warm. 70 plus degrees minimum, all right? And they'll be totally fine. If you live in an exceptionally cold place, you might have to add a heat mat on the side of the enclosure. Do not put it on the bottom and make sure whatever you make their enclosure out of can actually have that heat mat attached. If not, just put them somewhere where it's going to be 70 plus. If you're comfortable, they're going to be comfortable. You just don't want it to get lower than 70 degrees because at the end of the day, too chilly. They're not going to really move around as much. They're just they're not going to have a good time at the end of the day, which can cause digestion issues and all that problem. Uh, on the other side that's wet, you want it to be damp and you want to miss that pretty frequently, but you do not want the enclosure to get wet, okay? The reason for this is, yes, they're in a lot of the forest and jungles and whatnot there, so they can deal with some humidity and they can deal with some wetness, but they can't deal with it all of the time. So you just need to make sure to give them that biome, let them decide what they want to do. Make sure you give them lots of watery vegetables like um, like I said earlier, like the cucumbers or zucchinis or uh, butternut squash that'll have a lot of moisture in it. Uh, just don't give them any like iceberg lettuce. They'll be totally fine. And that will help them with any of the moisture they're not getting from the humid side. They're actually getting through the food that they're eating at the end of the day. But otherwise, as long as you keep that dry and wet side and let them choose what they want, they'll be totally fine. But again, just make sure that the left side or right side or whatever's your dry side that stays dry. Next, let's talk about longevity. Part of what makes these guys so expensive, and the reason they're so expensive is because Africa stopped all of its exports of all invertebrates, by the way. That's the why it went from used to being a $12 millipede to a $200 millipede. So the reason I'm mentioning longevity is, guys, it's worth the cost because these bad boys in the wild will live anywhere between seven to 10 years. In captivity, they tend to lean more towards that 10-year side, and they take a long time. 
I've had babies since seven months ago. The reason I'm just going to start selling them in January is because in that amount of time, they only grew this big. This is a species that grows 13 inches long. So you want to sell them when they're big enough that they're going to survive, but not so big that they're going to die in the next couple of years, right? Which is where most of the wild caught species you'll see. You know, if you look online and someone's selling for 150, guess what? If they're large, they're wild caught, which means you're not going to have much time left with them. So longevity wise, this is a very, very long lived millipede and they're super worth it at the end of the day. All right. Next, let's talk about fecundity. Do you have one of them? Was a wild caught? Is it a female? You might have babies, but you probably won't. And there's a reason for that. So the way that these guys do things is they actually like to lay their eggs in either super gross rotten uh, food or they like to lay it in actual poop. And the reason is because nothing wants to go eat the food if it's super disgusting. So for me, I make it pretty sloppy in there for them so they can lay some eggs and they'll actually let it get into it. I mean, dude, it's like soupy. They'll lay like three to 400 eggs. It's a lot of eggs at the end of the day. So if you do get a wild caught female, your chances of them being impregnated is pretty high, but your chances of actually having babies is relatively slim. Um, so don't worry too much about that. If you are trying to breed them though, it's very important. You're going to want one male and two females because even with one male and two females, I still struggled to get the babies that I had because there's just, um, the first little piece of their lifespan. They're not very hardy. I mean, anything that has that many babies, there's a reason they're laying that many eggs and it's because ultimately they're just not going to be able to all survive. Now, that being said, I am noticing more and more, though, that there are more and more and more babies and actually multiple generations of them at this point. So, you know, once they get going, they're going to get going if you're trying to breed them. But if you're just a hobbyist, just get one. You'll be totally fine. Don't worry about it. It's not like jumping spiders. We're going to get a mysterious sack and 100 babies you have to take care of that are mostly going to live in the next six months. So let's talk about pros. <laughs> Man. <laughs> There's very few cons with these guys. I, I mean, well, there are some, but the biggest piece about this is that these are incredible sized. 13 and a half inches. Look at the size of this guy. <laughs> They're so big. The males are much smaller than the females, obviously, and the females just get this massive, massive size to them that's so absolutely impressive, okay? Just awesome. Number two, they're really easy to take care of. Once you get your setup set up, I have not had to do any tweaks to it once I knew exactly what I was doing. That initial setup, honestly, will take you maybe a week of tweaking. After you get them set up, they're good, man. And they're going to live a long, long time. And, you know, they're a little skittish, but at the end of the day, they're also really fun to hold because they're just so sizable. And last but not least on the pros, as far as I'm concerned, these are the coolest body style of millipedes like don't get me wrong there are there are prettier millipedes there are uh you know more ornate and beautiful color millipedes but this is the millipede in my mind like this thing is so massive the size the coloration they got this cool reddish brownish color that's super super dope i just everything about them easy pets easy to feed cost effective if it's not for the cost of the actual bin they need this is a very a very affordable pet in terms of care but now let's talk about the cons there are two cons to these species well Actually, we'll name three, and the third one isn't their fault. Number one, they are expensive. To buy three of them cost me almost $900. <laughs> they are a very, very expensive pet in order to get them breeding. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm going to be able to sell these for $180 to $200 a piece, like, which is a very, very affordable price for these guys for captive bred giant African millipede babies. But something you need to consider is that not everyone has $200 laying around for this. And you probably don't want to spend that on a millipede, whether it lives seven to 10 years or not, especially if you're a tarantula person, because a 20 year tarantula can sometimes cost $6. So that's con number one. Con number two, they have symbiotic beneficial mites on them. 
Now, that's all fine and dandy. The point of the mites is ultimately to get between the layers. They got lots of little layers. They have 250 plus legs on these things. Each one of those little uh, separation of armored plates, they need to get food and detritus and everything out of there. So these mites have a hugely beneficial purpose, and that is to clean off them. Just to keep them clean is really what they do. And as far as what the uh, the millipede gets out of it, or what the other things get out of it, the mites rather, is that they get to eat all the stuff that's on them, which is a awesome, awesome sim uh, symbiotic relationship. You, however, might not like it much because people in the invertebrate world who come from the reptile world panic when they hear the word mites. These mites are fine, guys. They're grain mites or they're whatever type of mite, but they're, they're a symbiotic mite. They're not going to hurt them. They're going to be totally fine. They will be coating their whole body. And what's really cute is every so often they'll kind of like come up like a whale and breach and then slam on the ground and knock some of these mites off, which is super adorable. But just know if you itch when you think about itchy, scratchy mites, these guys are going to be covered in these guys sometimes. So you may occasionally have to just wipe them down with some, you know, uh, paper towel or something, but they'll be totally fine. But some people just are not a fan of those mites. And the last but not least is, I highly recommend this species to people that have kids if they're looking for a good starter millipede. Although with the price tag the way they are, maybe not the best uh, starter millipede. But the problem is they do and are, they have venom, or I mean poison rather. They're, they're a poisonous creature. They can secrete that directly from their skin. It's a, it's a cyanide base. So you just need to make sure as the last con that if you are going to pet these or hold these guys, that you do wash your hands when you're done. That's the only reason I even put this as a con is because it, and in all reality, any invertebrate that you're holding, you should wash your hands. But a lot of people don't. So I'm just telling you that this is a con that you need to consider. It's like owning a reptile. Just when in doubt, wash your hands. That's all I'm asking for you. Thank you again, Arthro people. Stay safe, stay educated, and most importantly, stay classy.